Now welcome to unit G of our SLAM lecture and this will be about particle filter SLAM. And the particular algorithm that we will talk about here is also known as fast SLAM. Now to put that into perspective, let's have a look at what we did so far. So we started with the following problem. A robot was placed in an arena with known landmarks and it measured the bearing angle and the distance to those landmarks and as it moved we were interested in obtaining the position and orientation in terms of a belief, meaning we knew that position and orientation won't be error free. Now one way of modeling this belief was in terms of a Gaussian distribution, which we used in our extended Kalman filter. So in the extended Kalman filter, we represented the robot's pose by the first moment of the distribution as a vector x, y, theta, and the uncertainty in terms of the second moments of the distribution that is the variance in x, y and theta and the corresponding covariances. And we also visualized the variance in theta by a disk segment and the x, y covariance matrix by an error ellipse. So this was our three-dimensional state. So this means if this is our 3D space of possible states x, y, theta, meaning for any given x, y and theta, I can grab the belief by computing the function value at that point and representing our belief as a Gaussian means that we define the first moment of the Gaussian distribution which will be the point in our 3D space where the peak will be and then the second moments which define the variances and covariances and so overall we can represent our distribution as an error ellipsoid in 3D space. And so far we depicted the marginal distributions of the two-dimensional subspace in XY as an error ellipse and the marginal distribution in theta as an interval which we visualized using this plus minus one sigma disk segment. A one sigma error ellipse which means that with a 68% probability our true position and orientation of the robot will be within this ellipse. Now again all this was for the extended Kalman filter where we represented our belief by a Gaussian distribution. Now in a subsequent unit we did the following. We replaced our representation by a set of particles. And we did so when we introduced the particle filter. So now we said in our 3D space of possible states, we use a set of hypothetical states or particles, where each single particle is indeed three-dimensional, namely it is a hypothetical state of a robot. And this way we represented our belief by a set of particles, where a high density of particles means that there is a high probability that this is actually the robot state. But using a particle filter, we were able to represent multimodal distributions. So for example, the high density of particles here indicates that the robot state is here. However, if we have a second group of particles, that would indicate a second possible state of the robot. Now, and if you remember the experiments we did with our small robot in the arena that started here, and so it went there, made a left turn and followed the trajectory somehow like that. And here we had typically the case that our particles were here, but some of the particles took a stronger left turn and were somehow here. And shortly after that, they fortunately died out. But this is exactly the situation that we see here, where we have one group of particles with a certain xy position and heading, and another group of particles with a different xy position and a different heading. And using either the Kalman filter or the particle filter, we estimated the robot's pose, so the position and orientation, which is a three-dimensional vector, whereas we did not estimate the position of the landmarks. So the positions of the landmarks were considered to be fixed and given in advance. And this changed in the last lecture, where we had a look at extended Kalman filter SLAM. And the problem was modified as follows. Our robot observes some landmarks which are not known in advance and by observing them it inserts them into a map but now as the robot's position is stochastic and the measurements are stochastic as well the landmarks positions are now stochastic too. 
So when the robot moves on, it observes the landmarks again, and since we observed them multiple times, the arrows get smaller, and ideally, the robot's uncertainty and position and heading get smaller too. Now everything is stochastic, the robot's position as well as the positions of all the landmarks, and so an extended column filter slam, we modeled this using our system state, which contains the pose of the robot, but also the positions of all landmarks. And consequently, our covariance matrix contained all the variances and covariances between the post and all landmarks. So the covariance matrix was 3 plus 2n times 3 plus 2n matrix. Now our belief looks like that. This is the space of all possible system states. And now unfortunately, I can't draw this anymore because the dimension is now 3 plus 2n. This means if I pick a point here, this gives me the belief that the robot is at position x, y with a heading of theta and all the landmarks are at position x1, y1, x2, y2 and so on until x and yn. And now in extended Kalman filter slam, we represented our belief by a multivariate Gaussian of that dimension. So this will be a high dimensional ellipsoid and unfortunately I can't draw anything else than this two-dimensional projection of a two-dimensional surface in 3D space. But just imagine this is the one sigma surface of 3 plus 2n minus 1 dimensions in 3 plus 2n dimensional space. And the probability of our system state to be in there, again, is 68%. And although we can't visualize this, we did so for the marginal distributions. Namely, imagine this is x and this is y, and so this is the other 1 plus 2n dimensions. And so the marginal distribution of this is this in the xy plane, and we visualize this in our viewer application by drawing that arrow ellipse in xy space. And we also did so for the one dimensional marginal distribution of theta, and we visualize this as this disk segment, and we also did so for the marginal distributions of the landmarks, where we represented the two-dimensional marginal distributions of the landmarks by error ellipse around the landmarks. So as you see, we were unable to visualize the distribution in 3 plus 2n dimensional space, and so instead we drew the marginal distributions of the robot pose and the landmarks. And so this was extended Kalman filter slam, and as you see, when we moved from our extended Kalman filter, which estimated the pose of the robot given a map of known landmarks, to our extended Kalman filter slam with unknown landmarks, we just added this part to our system state. And so we not only estimated x, y and theta, but also the positions of all the landmarks. And this of course has increased the size of our system state greatly. So if we want to move from extended Kalman filter slam to particle filter slam, we could proceed in exactly the same way, that is, we represent our belief by a set of particles, each one being a hypothetical system state, so that each single particle contains our pose as well as the positions of all the landmarks for a 3 plus 2n dimensional particle. So this would be straightforward. We've seen the extended Kalman filter and the particle filter both operating in 3D. And we have seen the extended Kalman filter slam operating in 3 plus 2n dimensions. And so we also set up our particle filter slam with particles which are 3 plus 2n dimensional. And unfortunately, this does not work very well because of the curse of dimensionality. And so it is the case that particle filters scale exponentially with the number of dimensions. Which means that if the dimension of space goes up, the number of particles that I will need to represent the distribution in this high dimensional space scales exponentially. And since this is dependent on the number of landmarks in the scene, meaning, for example, for 100 landmarks, the overall dimension is already 203, this will go up very quickly, and this simple approach here is not feasible. Now instead we will use a factorization of the posterior which is given here without a proof. The posterior of the full slam problem is the probability for the entire path of the robot from 1 to t and the map given all our measurements and all 
our control inputs. And interestingly, this can be factored into the probability for the entire path, given all the measurements and all the controls, times the product over all landmarks of the probability for the landmark location, given the entire path and all measurements. And this equation is not an approximation, it is exact. And so what we see here is a conditional independence. If the path is known, it follows that the locations of the landmarks are independent. Since those probabilities are independent of each other, we will represent them using independent Gaussian distributions. So we will use one extended Kalman filter for each landmark. So this is represented using independent extended Kalman filters, namely one per landmark. Whereas this is represented using particles. So we represent the distribution of our robot's paths using a particle filter. And for each particle, we represent the remaining part of the posterior by a set of Gaussian distributions, one distribution for each landmark. And this approach is also called a Rao likewellized particle filter. And again, this is not proven here. And you can find proof in the probabilistic robotics book by Fran Borgart and Fox. Now, even though we don't prove it formally, let me give you the following explanation. So we had the following situation. Our robot moved, so it was in different states. And while it moved, it measured some landmarks in the field of view. So from here, it observed those two landmarks. From here, it observed all three landmarks. From here, it observed those two landmarks, and so on. Now, this sequence of movements and observations led to this dynamic base network where we have this sequence of states control u1 to u3 and we perform some measurements which are related to our landmarks m1, m2 and m3. So m1 is seen from all three positions of the robot, m2 is seen from two positions and m3 is seen from two positions as well. So this is the dynamic base network that is generated by this situation. Now if you now think about the probability for our map. Now the posterior of our full slam problem includes all the states of the robot and all the positions of the landmarks. So for example, landmark number three is stochastic. So its x and y position are not fixed, but they are random variables according to a certain distribution. Now this landmark is observed, for example, by the robot when it is at position x3. Now, x3, on the other hand, is obtained from x2 by a stochastic movement of the robot, which follows another distribution. And x2 is obtained by the same procedure from x1. And on the other hand, when the robot is in state x1, it measures landmark number two. And so this means I can go from here, via this measurement to x3, and via the movement to x1 and to m1. So this means m3 and m1 are not independent because they are related by those measurement equations where m3 is measured or m2 is measured, as well as the state transition equations from state 1 to 2 and 2 to 3. However, now imagine that those positions would be fixed. So they're not stochastic. Or you could think of them as if they were measured using an instrument with a superior accuracy so that essentially those positions can be considered to be fixed. Now this means that this part here is fixed. However, this also means that I can't go from M3 to M1 using this path because this path would lead over non-stochastic variables, which is not possible. Or put in a different way, imagine you now have this instrument with superior accuracy and so you place it here. You measure from here to here Later on, you measure also from here to here and from here to here. So certainly, all those measurements lead to some uncertainty here. But since the black positions of your surveying instrument are fixed, they are not influenced by any calculations going on here to determine the position of the landmark. So since they stay fixed, for example, position of this landmark, which is measured from here and here, is not influenced at all by the calculations going on here. And so indeed, the outcome is the probability for the map given the path. And this is important. So if all those positions are given, and of course the measurements are given as well, then this can be factored into the product we had earlier of the probabilities of each individual map feature given the path and the measurements. So while we didn't prove it, this is some kind of explanation. We gave some indication why it is true Namely because if I condition the probability for the map on the path, so the path is known, 
those positions are fixed and the probabilities for the map features become independent and so I can compute the overall probability as a product of a probability for the individual map features. Well, let's have a look at this probability for the individual map feature. Now in this product of probabilities, where do we get this path from on which we condition the probability for the map? And remember, only this conditional independence allows us to write our probability for the map as a product of probabilities of the individual landmarks. And the trick is, as you've seen in an earlier slide, our full posterior is the product of those two terms. So the probability of a path, given all measurements and all controls, times the probability of the map conditioned on the path. Now in our raw blackballized filter, this part is represented by a particle filter. So we will have particle 1, particle 2, and so on, until particle m. And each of those particles will have its own path. So we'll use the superscript to denote the individual particles. Now this means the distribution of paths, given all those measurements and all that controls, is approximated by this set of particles. Now for one single particle, I now have this path, which is non-stochastic, because the distribution of paths is captured by the distribution of the particles. And so what remains for this particle is to express the probability of the map, which now, since I know the path, is conditioned on this known path, in which case the probabilities for the map features are independent. So here, the remaining elements in the particle describe the distribution of my landmarks, where I use one distribution for each individual landmark. And in our case, we will represent those distributions using Gaussian distributions. So we will have a mean and a covariance for our first landmark and for the second landmark and so on until the end landmark. And again we will indicate that this is for the first particle. And the same holds for the second particle and so on until the nth particle. And so this is the first part. It uses a particle filter to represent the distribution of paths. And this is the second part and it uses individual extended Kalman filters, namely one for each landmark.